It's the Blue Vote Cafe, a little bit wonkish, a whole lot of fun. I'm David Schellenberg, along with Rachel Wigster. We are the co-chairs for Democrats Abroad in Canada's capital of Ottawa. Hello, Rachel. Hello, David. How are you today? I am doing pretty good, actually, oh, good. oddly. Yeah, I got a, I got a little uh, run in this morning, got a fresh haircut. You know, oh. there's nothing quite like a fresh haircut to make somebody feel like uh, they're worth something. Kind of like a reboot. <laughs> yes, exactly. How are you? <laughs> I'm okay. The sun is shining and... No, I didn't do anything quite so productive today, but... Um, you didn't get a haircut? T- Not that that's productive. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had a haircut in a while. I'll probably do yeah. a trim. I don't ever go short. It's always long. Who's with us today? <laughs> <laughs> today, we are joined in the cafe by Simon Rosenberg, a longtime Democratic strategist who's worked on presidential campaigns and for and uh, trade policy and um, who gained notoriety in 2022 for getting the election right when everyone else was wrong. Um, it's a pleasure to have you, Simon. Welcome to the cafe. It's great to be here. Thanks to both of you. <laughs> so since now I feel we very... have to challenge you, yes, for the uh, results I know. of I... the election, this election coming up. <laughs> oh, the coming. Let's talk about 22 first so we know yeah. how credible this claim is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty credible. Um, so in, this, in fall of 2021, I wrote a memo saying I thought the election was going to be a close competitive election and not a traditional midterm for three reasons. One is that the Republicans had made this huge strategic error by running towards a politics, MAGA, which had failed in the last two elections. Usually when a party fails twice in a row, they tend to find a new politics and go in a new direction. Republicans chose not to do that, right? I mean, they double, triple down on MAGA. And and to me, I thought that meant that they were going to have a low ceiling in 2022. Second is that Joe Biden's a good president and we were going to have a good record to run on. And then third, and this is important for your audience, is that, you know, we have more tools today than we've ever had to turn out our voters and to engage Democrats across the country and around the world in our politics, Zoom, podcasts. You know, remote texting and phone calling, postcarding, all these new things that really kind of sprung up during COVID has made it much easier for people to stay connected to our politics. And I felt that what what would happen is it would be much less likely that we would have the normal midterm drop off that happens in a midterm election. And so those three things, right, them embracing an ugly, terrible politics, MAGA, second, is Joe Biden is a good president. We were going to have a lot to run on. And third is that we had these unprecedented tools to drive turnout. And that's and that I argued we'd have a close competitive election and not a red wave. And that's actually what happened. And so um, and it's we've had, you know, the backdrop to 2024 now is that if I can do this really quickly, is mm-hmm. that, you know, in 20, we know that in 2018 and 2020, Democrats had two very good elections in a row. Right. We took away the House, the Senate, the presidency from Trump and MAGA. But then what's happened since is really important and in some ways more important almost than what happened in 2018 and 2020, because the party in power always loses seats, Mm -hmm. almost always. Almost always. Almost always. It's very rare. It takes extraordinary circumstances. Um, And so, but that hasn't happened. In fact, we've gained ground in 2022 and 2023 and now in early 2024. Yeah. And it shows that there's this incredible dynamic in our politics today where the most powerful dynamic in our country isn't disappointment in Joe Biden or worry about the economy. It's the fear and opposition to MAGA. And that's been driving our politics since 2018. And it's caused, you know, not only did we have two good elections, but we've now had you know, a great election in 2022 where we gained in uh, Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New Hampshire. We picked up a Senate seat. We picked up state legislative chambers. We picked up governorships. And then in 2023, we won all across the country in Wisconsin and in Ohio. We took away the six-week abortion ban. We flipped the Virginia House, right? We took away Jacksonville and, and, um, and uh Colorado Springs, two of the largest Republican health cities in the country. Right. And then we're seeing again in 2024, similar growth expansion for the Democrats, continued struggle for the Republicans. And we can get into that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But it's a central reason I'm so optimistic about our chances mm-hmm. of winning this election in November. So strategist for for thirty years. So uh, have you been you've been around Joe Biden for thirty years? Like tell us tell us <laughs> t- tell us something about Joe Biden that we don't know. 
Um, he's funny, actually, um, you know, in person. I, I don't know Joe Biden that well. Right. I, I would just say I've worked with a lot of I was a Clinton guy. I was much closer to Bill and Hillary Clinton in my younger days. I was an early Obama supporter. I was an early Biden supporter as well. And I've been in meetings with him and spoken to him. I would say that, you know, I think what we've learned about him and I don't know that we all you know, knew what he was going to be as president. I think we have to recognize, to me, the most, there are two things that I take away about Joe Biden as president. One is he works his ass off, right? He really, yeah. he's grinding it out every day. I mean, even at his age, right? He's got an unbelievably ambitious schedule. He travels all the time. He does international travel. He's doing events six days a week. I mean, it is every week, right? I mean, he's not taking... A lot. I, I frankly, there's an argument to be made. He's not taking enough time off, given mm -hmm. you know how those of us who are formerly young understand that when you get a little <laughs> bit older, you need to sleep a little bit more, right? Um, and you do it when you're a thing, teenager, and then you do it again when you get later. And, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm looking forward to sleeping a little bit more. Um, but the second thing is that you know he showed a remarkable amount of ambition. In legislative ambition in tw in 2021 and 2022, essentially defying conventional wisdom, defying the how, the amount of power he actually had, right? Historically, defying you know he didn't play it safe. He took big risks. He made a decision, right, that he was going to be in the White House for who knows how long, and he was going to go for it. And I think that belies kind of the understanding of who he is a little bit, right? That this guy is a workhorse, not a show horse. He's produced extraordinary results for the American people. <laughs> he doesn't do just the easy things. He does hard things, too, like getting out of Afghanistan, which was not an easy thing, but it was the right thing to do. Right. Um, and I think he's shown a degree. I, I think that in a time where he took office, when we were in the middle of COVID, the vaccines had not come. The economy was in recession. The world was teetering. We just had an insurrection in Washington, which basically put the city under military lockdown for you know almost two months. It, 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 I think we'll look back on this period and realize that having the most experienced person to ever enter the Oval Office was a blessing for all of us and not something to rue. And you know that having this guy, and I think this is going to be critical to his reelection, which is that we have to make the argument that he's been successful because of his age and ex experience and wisdom, mm. not, in, not in spite of it. And I think we can't run away from that. So I've been I've been really impressed with, despite his age and the fact that he could have taken it easy, this guy has busted his ass for us every day since he's been in the White House, and he's delivered for the American people. So why isn't there more widespread recognition of that, do you think? You know, we could have spend the rest of the of this podcast probably talking about, <laughs> talking that. about that. Yeah, and I and I think the honest answer is I don't know that any of us really know. You know, I think I think that to me, the most compelling reason is that um, that the Republicans have developed an extraordinary propaganda machine in the United States that they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in for over a long period of time, and that it's very powerful right now and as mainstream media. You know, is um, stumbling, retreating, yeah. Yeah. you know, shrinking, you know, shrinking, you know, struggling. Mm -hmm. That the power of their noise machine is increased uh, every day, and I think that Joe Biden has done a lot of things really well. I don't know, having been, having not, having been a senator of a very small state where he knew everybody, mm. it's possible that he didn't have. The kind of communication strategic chops that one would have if you had come from a bigger state or a more Republican state, for oh, example, interesting, right? Interesting, or been yeah. or been a governor as opposed to a senator. Yeah. And it's possible that Biden did what he did in the Senate, right? Which is he just went to work every day. Yeah. And that he didn't, and took the train home. <laughs> he took the train home and, and then like shook the hands of half the state on the way yeah. back, you know, yeah. in the train station, right? <laughs> and um, you know, and I think it's possible that he didn't really understand, despite having been the VP for eight years under an enormous and incredibly talented communicator, mm -hmm. it's possible that their information advantage and superiority over us 
um, was not something that was adequately understood in the in the grant in the sort of the the guts of early Biden. And the second thing is when Biden became president, right? He was in the middle of COVID. I mean, he couldn't really see anybody in the outside world up until right. almost a year after he'd been president. And so, I think it created an insularity, perhaps, and a distance for him and from the American people mm-hmm. that he's still recovering from, in essence, that was inevitable. It was bigger than him, right? I mean, he had to be this guy behind the glass, you know, the glass window, right, for the first year. And I think it created a distance for him. Interesting. That is is not actually consistent with who he is as a politician. I mean, he's a great retail politician. Mm-hmm. And so I think some of this had to do with the weird circumstances that he assumed I mean, I I will tell you that, you know, my wife works in the White House. She's the deputy Homeland Security Advisor. And, Hmm. you know, so I'm married into the Biden family. (laughs) Administration. (laughs) Um, But they, I can't tell you how hard it was to make the White House work during COVID and, and how little credit, frankly, they really get for having entered in where there was the first we didn't have a peaceful transfer of power. Right. My right, first time in our history. Right. They were in the midst of this raging pandemic with a, an old person at the head with old people dying all over the place in the United States. We had just had insurrection. And so there was this sense of lack of phys- physical security in Washington that was unprecedented. It was like being at home after home invasion or whatever you want to call it. Right. 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 And where all these people all of a sudden realized that. You know, Nancy Pelosi's office was violated. I mean, imagine yeah. how she felt in terms of like, okay, my own Capitol Police can't keep me safe. Mm-hmm. And it's COVID. I mean, it just was, there was just incredible. This whole city was, and and they came in and they made everything work. Mm-hmm. And it was incredible. They had mm-hmm. no, you know, there was barely any transition. They didn't have the normal handover of information, right? They were having to like, understand what was happening with COVID in real time, right? Yeah. Because yeah. they didn't have any and they couldn't trust the data. And so I do think when we think about that, about what America was like on January 20th, 2021, it's amazing how far we've come, right? As all of your listeners know, I mean, the U.S. has had the strongest recovery of any G7 country. Um, you know, our GDP growth now is twice that of any other G7 country since the beginning of COVID. Mm, wow. We have the lowest un- we have the lowest inflation rate of in the G7. And you know, the American economy today is you know, we go through these periods where the economy goes from being strong to really strong, right? I mean, it's right now like in the late 90s, right, the American economy boomed. We're in a boom in America. I mean, we've had it's the best the best, if I can do this really quickly, I mean, not yeah. only is the stock market breaking records, all three indices, but we have the best job market in America since the 1960s, the lowest uninsured rate in American history. We have new business formation, which is an incredible sign of this health and vitality of an economy, is running at about twice the rate as normal in history. Real wages are increasing right now at a higher level than they have in generations. Um, you know, we crime rates have plummeted all across the United States. Um, you know, I, I, and I find fascinating. We're drilling yeah. for oil in the United States in a bigger way than ever before. And, and well, that gets we, lost. We, we, we produced more oil, gas and renewable energy last year than we have in any year in our history, making us far more in energy independent than we've ever, you know, than we've been in a long time. Yeah. You know, and, and so and, you know, our companies are number one, number two in virtually every sector and and in in you know throughout the world and in many ways we're actually stronger relative to china than we had been you know we actually had stronger growth in recent year last year than china did for the first time in 30 something years and so you know the countries we're in the middle of a boom here in the US i mean i can't tell you you know for those of you who don't who haven't spent much time here in recent years mm-hmm. you know every small business has a job openings on their windows. And, you know, my son is a diesel mechanic in Idaho and, you know, they nobody can fire anybody because they can't find any workers. And so, you know, there's there's no it's it's really incredible. Like, I mean, we, we are living in the lowest unemployment rate that we've had in peacetime economy since World War II. I mean, two thirds of Americans have never lived in a country the unemployment rate has been this low um, in their lifetime. And and so we're in the midst of an extraordinary boom. And then Biden, 
you know, what we're beginning to see is the fruits of these three big bills that Biden passed that made unprecedented, unprecedented or recent in recent precedent anyway, mm-hmm. investments in the future of the country and opportunity for workers for a generation. And those things are really starting to pay off now. I mean, they're going to pay off for 25 years and our, you know, our acceleration of our transition to the, you know, the energy transition is accelerating. I mean, things in the United States are actually objectively going very well, even if our politics, even if one of our two political parties is broken. Right. Yes, so, because Donald Trump waddles up to a microphone and says whatever he wants to say, and and people believe it because he, he sells it really well. Yeah, 40% of the country believes it. Yeah. You know, I mean, the truth is, we're going to come up with the right slogan for this about Trump, right? Is that the thrill is gone. The emperor has no clothes. We're pulling the back, the uh, curtain back on the wizard. Um, you know, that this is a television show that is on the verge of being canceled again. I mean, whatever mm-hmm. the analogy is we're going to use about him, he's a spent force. He's not the same that he was. He's far weaker as a candidate than he was in 2020. And and if I can go through this quickly, Please do, he's yeah. far more degraded than he was in 2020. He's far more extreme and more dangerous. His performance on the stump is far more erratic and disturbing and wild. And, you know, he's entering into places that feel like madness far more than he used to. Um, you know, he is he's making traditional political mistakes that are the kind of mistakes that candidates who lose elections make. He came out against the ACA. It's one of the most popular programs in America. Yeah. Um, there's no upside for him to do that. He's never going to repeal it. It was gratuitous and stupid and impulsive and the kind of mistakes that you know politicians who lose make, having done this now for over 30 years. But finally, and I think this is very important for your um, listeners who are not in the U.S. to recognize there are going to mm-hmm. be six thing, six bits of information that voters are going to have about Trump that they didn't have about him in 2020 in um, that in an election he already lost. Right? Mm-hmm. And those six things are that he raped E. Jean Carroll in a department store dressing room. That's a fact. He's a rapist. Mm-hmm. Second is that he oversaw one of the largest financial frauds in American history. And between him and Rudy Giuliani for all of their crimes, they now owe various government entities $700 million together, right, <laughs> yeah, from yeah. the last few weeks. Third yeah. is that he led an insurrection against the United States. He led an armed attack against the capital of the United States. And he's promised to end American democracy for all time if he's in the Oval Office in 2025. He also stole America's secrets. He lied to the FBI about it. He shared those secrets with other people. These are all indisputable Mm -hmm. facts. Mm -hmm. Fifth is that he and his family corruptly have taken more money from foreign governments than any family in American history, political family, that is. And then sixth is that he is singularly responsible for ending Roe and stripping the rights and freedoms away of more than half the population, something that he is now repeatedly telling his own supporters, again, on camera at every event. He is taking credit for having ended Roe. And now we know through this IVF decision, which you can Mm -hmm. get into in the future, that they're not going to stop with abortion. They're going to keep going. And that, you know, what happened in this country, I think, was very, this, this IVF thing was very important because it was like, you know, getting the secret notes of a, a meeting, a, a notes of a secret meeting about what mm-hmm. their real intentions are, which mm-hmm. is that, you know, they want women to be chattel again here in the United States and not having the independent rights and freedoms that women have throughout the developed world. And so those six things that he has done were not known to voters in 2020. And any one of these six things could prevent him from being president. I don't know how he overcomes all six things, mm-hmm. particularly given that MAGA has been has lost in 2018, 2020, 2022, and 2023, and is struggling out of the box in early 2024. Yeah. So do you think enough voters will recognize this to prevail in 2024? That's what a campaign is for. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what 300, 400, 500 million dollars is for. Yeah. That's the job of people like me who go on television all the time. I mean, I, you know, the first time that I had to say that Donald Trump 
Ray teaching Carol in a department store dressing room, it was hard for me to say it. I, yeah. I felt, you know, we can't have any inhibition, right? We have an obligation to tell the truth to our fellow citizens about who he is and how he's different than he was. And we can't be, we can't, we can't self-censor here, right? We have to take the admonition of Dr. Timothy Snyder from Yale and do not obey in advance. And we have to, self-censorship is how he wins, right? We need to put, be clear-eyed about who he is and what he represents and the kind of nation that we will have if he's the next president. That's our obligation. That's why you're here, right? The two of you are here, right? Mm -hmm. You're tr mm -hmm. truth tellers, and it's what we have to do. And I think that the reality is that the Republican Party in 2024 is the ugliest American political party since the Democratic Party of the 1850s. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is the most despicable, terrible, horrible human being that's ever run for president in all of our history. Um, you know, democracy here and everywhere is on the line. Look at the damage he's doing to the United States as a candidate. Imagine what he'll do as president. And, yeah. you know, we got to leave it all in the playing field. And for all the listeners here, you know, if you're wondering, you know, how much time and energy you're going to spend on this election, it should be, you know, the most you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because this is the stakes are, you know, all of you who live abroad have an understanding of the damage that's being done to the United States reputation because of the of our abandonment or our temporary abandonment of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, imagine, you know, if I mean the Republican Party now, a big chunk of the Republican Party in Washington is a, is a, is acting as a Russian fifth column. I mean, we have, you know, part of the Republican Party has been turned by Putin, and it's just a reality. I mean, it sounds absurd, right? It sounds like a John le Carre mm -hmm. no novel, right? But it's it actually happening. Yeah, but it's actually yeah. happening, yeah. and we can't look away at, at it. And and it's and so this election is the big one, and we need everybody, you know, uh, working as hard as they can, and in whatever way you can, uh, to make sure that we win. And so, you're right when there's there's so much of it. That's absurd. Like uh, reading through your Wikipedia page, which is the extent of research I did for this. Um, but but the name uh, Howard Dean shows up in there, and and yeah. and and I can just remember, you know, Howard Dean yelled "woo" into a microphone in an incorrect way, and my vague recollections was that cost him the election. So, what what's changed that we're still allowing a Donald Trump to keep on going? No, oh, it's not allowing. Right, it's a democracy. <clears throat> and, you know, I think it speaks to the power of this right wing noise machine that they've that, you know, this propaganda machine that they've built, that they can, you know, take convince people that the emperor is wearing clothes. Right. That this guy's a you know, I have this line. You know, you guys have a little bit of a sense of humor, which you need to, <laughs> which you need. Yeah, me, 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 too. It's a little hard sometimes. But um, but I have this line about Trump, which is you can dye his hair paint his face, strap a girdle on him and a diaper two, and pump him full of speed, and the guy's still not going to look like a presidential candidate ever again. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I think, though, that the absurdity of him, his orangeness, I call him the orange emperor in my, yes. in my sub stack, right? The absurdity of his look. And the fact that, you know, this guy wears more makeup than a drag queen, right, every day. <laughs> and, and he's somehow seen as a, an epitome of a masculinity and macho is mm -hmm. it's, it's just like it's just it's, it's all so like, weird it's, it's just smoke it's, and mirrors yeah. it's all terrible is what mm -hmm. it is right yes. and <laughs> and and it speaks to the you know i the most important thing for your listeners to realize is that you know as we're seeing even in look my view about what's happened in recent years is that something in the republican party broke when dobbs happened and roe ended in the spring of 2022 that for a large chunk of Republicans, it was just too much. It was too far. It was like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, this is just, you know, this crazy party has really crossed the Rubicon here mm -hmm. or crossed into a place where it had become dangerous at that point, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and and literally dangerous, right? I mean, and, yeah. you know, Germany just issued a, a warning for all of their citizens traveling to the United States to a, a specific warning about pregnant women Germans coming here and recognizing that they may not be able to get the health care they need because of what's happened. And so you're now getting warnings telling people that it's unsafe to travel to the United States if you're pregnant, right? Because of yeah. depending on where you are. Imagine that. I mean, it's just so, but, but the point is, is that since Dobbs, 
the Democrats have overperformed in all these elections that I went through and Republicans have struggled. And it's because I think that there's a big chunk of the Republican Party that is just done. It would, you know, if we were in a European parliamentary system, which we're not, I mean, we have a very unique political system in the United mm-hmm. States. Yeah. Globally, if we were in a European style parliamentary democracy, <clears throat> Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney would have started a new party. Liz Cheney would probably be in our cabinet. You know, they'd be in our coalition, right? Our big tent coalition. Trump would be running the right wing nationalist party. Mm-hmm. But that's not how our system works, right? And essentially, a bunch of extremists hijacked one of America's two political parties. Um, and a big chunk, though, of what used to be called the Republican Party, you know, as I say, the party of Lincoln is now forever. The party of Lincoln and Reagan is now forever the party of insurrection in American history is that the a big chunk of that party, 20, 30 percent, is really not on board with what's going on with MAGA. Mm. Right. And part of the reason we did so well in 2022 is that that group of non-MAGA Republicans you know, which is a big chunk. It's 20 to 30 percent of the Republican Party. You know, a bunch of them split off and voted for Democrats. And it's how we got to 59 percent in Colorado and 57 percent in Pennsylvania and 55 percent in Michigan, 54 percent percent in New Hampshire, because the coalition, they couldn't pull the coalition back together. And I think the same thing is likely to happen in this election, that Trump is MAGA on steroids now, right? Double MAGA, MAGA squared, right? Yeah, Whatever yeah, you want yeah. to call it. Whatever, hyper, yeah. hyper MAGA, right? Hyper MAGA, yeah. And, and that, and there MAGA, was, MAGA. And, and so what you're seeing mega, in the polling, mega. MAGA, mega, mega, mega. Right? super <laughs> MAGA, right? Is that what you're seeing in the or polling in the early states, in the early Republican primary states, is that there are, and it's stunning data, by the way, that I'll give you an example. In, in Iowa, 43% of Haley voters, Nikki Haley voters, said they would vote for Biden in the general election. Mm. That's that's 5% of the whole electorate, if mm-hmm. you extend it across the whole country. Right. That's one out of 20 voters in America. That takes an even race and makes it a blowout for us, right? And so you're seeing in polling the kind of data, and by the way, you saw similar results in New Hampshire, similar results now in South Carolina, where um, there is a huge universe of Republicans that are saying that they would vote for Biden. We've never had polling data like that in modern American history. Mm. I mean, maybe the, probably the last time we ever saw data like that was in the 84 Reagan election. Um, and, you know, it's been 40 years since we've seen that. And I don't even know that to be a fact. I'm assuming we did, given how well Reagan did. Right. But, you know, we're, you're seeing. And, and so what's been interesting, if you look at American media over the last couple of days, we've now started having the first wave of stories about whether Trump, whether there are now actual warning signs about the Trump candidacy showing up in both the election results and in polling. Because in the election results, which matters just as much as polling, right? And if you want to learn about an election, yeah, you know, looking at how people are voting in the election actually can help you figure that out a little bit, right? Is um in these three early states, he's underperformed public polling by close to 10 points in all three states. Mm. That's a huge red blinking light about wow. the health of his candidacy. Right. In Iowa, there were he got 56,000 votes. 700,000 registered Republicans in Iowa did not vote for Donald Trump on, mm. you know, 93%. If he was so powerful and compelling and amazing, why didn't people show up in Iowa? Why did he do so much worse in New Hampshire than he expected? He did much worse in South Carolina than was expected. Nikki Haley outraised him last month in money, which is just an extraordinary Yes. Thing, right? Yeah. Given given the Trump, you know, sneakers and everything else. And <laughs> and so <clears throat> so all of this to me means that this basic dynamic we've seen in American politics since Dobbs, which is we keep overperforming the expectations in polling, they keep underperforming and struggling, has played out throughout twenty twenty two, it played out throughout twenty twenty three, and now it's playing out in twenty twenty four. And you're starting to see now for the first time in this cycle, real like Anna, like Nate Cohn, the New York Times today, wrote a piece saying, you know, Trump is underperforming. This is real now. Mm-hmm. Right. And and these kinds of underperformances, you know, 
Because if the election's about even in the U.S., and I know everyone thinks Trump is leading, but he, he isn't really. I mean, no, not overall. Stri- yeah, no. When you strip out the Republican polls and the sort of junky polls, it's it's within margin of error. It's a close race. Right. We're not we're not ahead. I mean, I think it's a dead even race right now, with a lot of undecided. And um, but Trump is not ahead, and he's showing a lot of like big red, you know, the blinkers going off. Right. I mean, the Republican Party as an entity, and for those of you who live, live abroad where parties often are more important than they are in our system, mm-hmm. the Republican Party is in unprecedented disarray. I mean, they've, they're they firing the RNC chair and the entire senior, senior leadership team. Dozens of Republican Party officials across the country have been indicted for trying to overturn an American election and are going to go to jail, felony mm-hmm. level crimes in all of these cr- critical battleground states, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, third is you have a mass exodus of House Republicans out the door that is shocking how many prominent, serious, the, the people in the Republican House who are serious people and not the crazy people are all leaving in unprecedented numbers. Um, the RNC is completely broke. Trump is burning through more cash than he's actually raising, which in our system is almost impossible to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, everywhere you look, Trump's losing court cases left and right and getting crushed in the courts. Everywhere you look, you see meltdown, you see struggle that the GOP right now is an unprecedented shit show. <laughs> and and that, you know, they're weak. They're not strong. I mean, if you would do this basic language, right? I have this basic mantra for everyone who here is listening. Here's mm-hmm. my basic take on the election. Yeah. Joe Biden is a good president. The country's better off. The Democratic Party is strong in winning elections all across the country. And they have Trump, the most unfit guy to run for president in all of our history. And in every way possible, as we head into 2024, I would much rather be us than them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And And that's my take about where things are currently in the U.S. It's amazing. And in fact, it's a good segue because we haven't even mentioned the project that you're engaged on. So, oh, wait, before we get into what, that, what, 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 yeah. what, what? <laughs> one more one more Trump thing. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you have to wonder if sooner or later Donald Trump is going to have one too many cheeseburgers and, <laughs> and, and just not be around? And could the the inner circle of the GOP be fully aware of that and just kind of waiting him out? I, th- I think that there's a more proximate thing, two two proximate things that they are going to have to deal with. One is that, you know, he's losing in court and, mm. and he's having these judgments against him that are very significant. And we know from polling data that this 20 to 30 percent of their coalition is really unhappy about that. And, the you know, he's got in late March, he has his first criminal trial and he's almost certainly going to lose um, and so he could be sentenced to jail, you know, in the next six to eight weeks. That doesn't weeks. seem to matter. It does matter. It do, we know from polling it matters a lot, actually. It's okay. going to be, and even, you know, we, th- this issue of him being a serial criminal, and um, again, 40% of the country is unavailable for us. 60%, we're operating in 60%. That's who we're talking to, right? Mm-hmm. And. This stuff does matter to people. I mean, to the Republicans that you know, your friends who are Republicans, who are law abiding citizens. Yeah, law abiding citizens, country club Republicans, whatever. This kind of behavior is just not okay, right? I mean, Donald Trump, because of having now been an adjudicated rapist, you know, couldn't hold a leadership position in a Boy Scout troop, let alone, yeah. you know, being something that was, you know, um, you know, and, and this is going to be a material issue for him, right? I mean, he imagine if he becomes president, he no woman leader in the world is going to meet with him, mm. yeah. right? And and so the the thing that I would just say to you is that so one is the the issue of his extraordinary ongoing losing streak <laughs> in the court cases that he's in is going to become very material very soon. The second thing is that he's diminished. He's a dimin- he's very diminished for all the arguments about Biden. I think for those of you who have had an elder parent or have gone through aging with somebody, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know that one of the most common manifestations of decline is impulsivity. And his impulsivity, his inability to stay on script, to not say things that are damaging to him, Right. He is he is levels of impulsivity 
are off the charts. When you watch him talk, he says crazy things all mm-hmm. the time now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's clearly in severe cognitive decline. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, if you spend any time listening to I hadn't really listened. I don't pay attention to what he says. No. And I went on a show a couple of weeks ago where they played a bunch of clips <laughs> of him. And honestly, I was I was shocked on air. I was shocked at the things that he was saying. I was shocked how far gone he is. And so it means that on the central thing, because it's my view about where the other place we are right now in the election, as we were describing earlier, is that all the Republican talking points against Biden are evaporating, right? The economy is strong. It's not weak. Inflation is down. It's not up. Crime is not raging. It's plummeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is no war in energy. You know, we are more energy independent than we've you know, arguably than we've been in decades. Uh, Joe Biden isn't corrupt. We learned that, you know, that the case that was being yeah, brought against God. him was a Russian disinformation operation, another yet another one, right, mm-hmm. connected to Ukraine. Um, and then the one area they had left was the border and the immigration, border. Yeah. which they've blown, because now we're going to be able to argue that we're the ones who want an orderly border and not immigrants not flowing into the country. And they're the ones who want border chaos and immigrants flowing into the country. And this is an example of, in my mind, of Trump's diminishment, that he allowed himself to get played like this, where one of his areas where he had an advantage, he's now fumbled and given it to us, you know, in a, in a very clumsy and stupid and impulsive way. And so all if you believe Simon, and those six areas are areas where <laughs> they no longer have any kind of significant advantage rhetorically and over time, it leaves them with this central argument that Biden is, you know, diminished. And the problem is their guy is more diminished than our guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's more in decline than our guy is. And and if you want to argue over who's more fit to serve, the president has left the country far better than he found it, or this crazy serial criminal, rapist, fraudster, blah, 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 aren't, you know, who wears more makeup than drag queens. I mean, whatever you want to wear diapers now, we know. I mean, you can see it in the pictures, right? Um, what? Is, I haven't seen that. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. It's, oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, there's that been one. You no, know, no, you're, you're going to have fun over the next few days. Going, <laughs> I don't want to Google that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you can, go, no, you can Google that. No. Oh, you can Google that. No. It's, been, it's girdles, girdles, no. di- girdles, diapers, whatever, you know, whatever it is. And so the one area that they have really invested the most. The place where they've made their greatest investment in attacking Biden is on his age and his frailty. And the problem is, is that if this is going to be a question of who's more fit to serve, they're not going to win that mm-hmm. argument. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, as somebody who's been doing this a long time, right, has worked in presidential campaigns and been a strategist, they don't, they've got nothing now. They got, you know, what all that's happened is that all these major talking points and indictments of Biden have evaporated. And what's it, what it's left them with is the Mad King and their extremism and the orange, the orange emperor, the whatever you want to call him. And, and what it's doing is that it's further exposing their extremism, their madness to a country that's repeatedly rejected it already. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where they go. I mean, I wrote in my Substack today, this publication that I publish every day, about how I I showed a speech that Trump gave over the weekend. He now has a new attack on Biden. And it's it's like it's like a cartoon. <laughs> I mean, it's not Joe Biden. It's it's the guy he wants to run against. The problem is mm. that guy is doesn't exist. It's an invention and it's a silly invention. You know, it's like crayons. It's not <laughs> you know, it's like it's politics through crayons. And I think this is a, a sign of his diminishment. I go back to this basic idea that he can't he can't really compete in the real world anymore because he's so in his what Greg Sargent, the former columnist of the Washington Post, is now with the New Republic. Greg calls it Foxlandia, right? This mm-hmm. yeah. imaginary world, right, where the economy's in recession, it's not strong. You know, where Joe Biden's you know running a crime family, where we over you know where we cheated in the election in 2020. You know, well, all this stuff that they talk about, which is all made up and invented yeah. and imaginary, yeah. Yeah. that world Trump lives in that world. The problem is there's this thing called the real world, an objective reality over here where he can't really go there anymore. And it's almost like he's got a translation problem. You know, he's speaking 
I, I joke about this. He speaks a dialect of American English called MAGA, mm-hmm. and that dialect doesn't really translate to the broader public. No. And when you listen to him speak, right, there are times when he says things where you actually have no idea what he's referencing, right? Because it's this internal, crazy MAGA language. And and so it's my view that to some degree, MAGA ha- is in a form of secession from the United States. They're in a form of secession from our democracy and rule of law. They're in a form mm-hmm. of secession mm-hmm. linguistically and in terms of the reality of the world that they live in. They're they're in a form of secession against modern science and mm-hmm. and so on. And it's not a geographic secession. It's an ideological one. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where, you know, my hope is that we win this election by eight to 10 points, that this election is a clear repudiation of MAGA and that it starts to loosen MAGA's dark grip on the Republican Party. But, you know, we're in a place where we've got a, a um, you know, a, a, an American political party that's basically gone crazy. And it's not going to be easy. We're not going to snap back quickly. And no. all of you who live in countries that have had struggles with their democracy, yeah, this is not going to be a simple process, assuming we prevail and that we come out the other end and liberal American global leadership and the world that we've known for the last 80 years is there for our kids and our grandkids. This process of how we deal with the radicalization and the extremism that's happened, that's, that's come in America is going to be a tough and painful process for many, many years to come, mm-hmm. e- even if we're victorious, right? And and we have to recognize this is a long haul fight. Right. Oh, my goodness, Simon, there's so many questions I want to continue asking you, but we haven't even talked yet about the project that you're engaged in now. And <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about the Hopium Chronicles. Yeah. So I, I ran an organization called NDN, which was essentially a private think tank for the Democratic Party for a long time. And we did strategy and policy and macroeconomic policy. I did a lot of demographic research. I did the first poll of Latinos ever done in the Democratic Party, the first Mm. poll of millennials. I've been involved in a lot of, you know, the basic thing a think tank does is you get to think ahead. You have the luxury of not not drinking water from a fire hose every day like politicians do. And Mm. so I, I did that for a long time and it was very gratifying. And I was doing that in 2022. But I made a decision after the election in 2022 that I needed to find a new way of fighting because uh, I was running a 501c4. There were extraordinary limitations in speech and political activity and nonprofits. And so I founded a media organization taking a, a play out of the playbook of Republicans who've now run most of their politics through media and not through traditional political organizations. Um, and I built a community called Hopium Chronicles. And, you know, we are a community of, as I like to say, of proud patriots who love their country, who are fighting every day to prevent their democracy and freedoms from slipping away. It was always from the beginning. We be- began in early March of last year. It was a always a place to do things and not just talk about things. It was do we do things, right. right? And so we helped flip the Wisconsin Supreme Court seat last April, and now we've taken away the rancid redistricting in yeah. Wisconsin. We <laughs> yeah, helped, we helped flip. <laughs> so yeah. weird, yeah, yeah. We a huge win. We helped our community helped flip Jacksonville, Florida, the largest city in Florida, and began to give Democrats confidence again that there was a road back uh-huh. for us in that critical state. We played a role in. You know, taking away the six-week abortion ban in Ohio, we played a major role in flipping the state house in Virginia, and you know, bloodying Yunkin, and taking away this fantasy idea of the 15-week abortion ban in uh, in Virginia. And today, by the way, just a few weeks ago, Virginia just elected their first black speaker in the in the heart of the Confederacy and all of its history. Right? Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. won a critical supreme, I mean, a state house seat in Orlando, Florida last month. And then we played a major role in this big victory we had in New York three, Tom Swazi mm-hmm. last, you know, two weeks ago. And, and so we're not only do we debate and discuss and talk and learn together and become information warriors for our democracy at Hopium, but we also do things. Um, and, and, you know, people write postcards and they make calls. And my, one of my proudest moments was that during the Swazi race, and I, we're up to about 43,000 members of the community now. It's growing pretty rapidly. And um, about 15% of our members, by the way, are from abroad or outside the United States. Um, huh. I'm assuming many people listening here or some people listening here today. <laughs> um, but the um, 
My favorite moment so far, and perhaps in all of Hopium project, is that um, on election night, uh, the Swazi campaign, you know, they, New York polls stay open to nine o'clock. It's pretty late compared yeah. to most other places. They'd had snow that day. So turnout, the election yeah. day turnout was low. Yes. And they had what are called GOTV targets, which are people they're calling that they know haven't voted, was bigger than it normally is at the end of the day because voting had been a little light. So, so they had, uh, yeah, they had capacity. And so they emailed me and said, will you email out to your community, um, you know, saying we've got two and a half hours more phone calling. And I did. And 300 people clicked what? through and started making calls oh, right away. Wow. But wow. I got a message from one. Of, yeah, I got a message from one of my Hopium members saying, "Simon, so glad you're doing it. I'm sitting in a backyard in Los Angeles. There are 12 of us here who've been making calls into New York three oh. all day. It was you know warm, and they were outside, unlike the freezing cold of the Northeast that day. And <laughs> and and I think that's what people have to recognize, you know, in terms of how you can help here in the U.S. I mean, not only voting and getting everyone you've ever met to go vote and making it central to what you do. But also, you know, with this new technology, you can now, um, you know, do remote phone calling and texting into swing areas. The Biden campaign, if you want to pick a part of Pennsylvania or a part of Michigan where you're just going to make phone calls for six months, get up a little bit early, potentially, you know, not or stay up late, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, depending, yeah. on, and, um, depending yeah. on where you are. And yep. And, you know, there's a lot you can do from overseas and to help, you know, push the boat to what we need. And part of the reason we keep doing so well as Democrats is that basically there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people who've decided they're not going to let their democracy slip away. And they're spending 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, whatever it is, making calls, doing, you know, postcards, giving a little bit of money here and there. Um, and they're staying engaged all the time in, in saving democracy, not just reading about it, not talking about it, but taking action. And the line at Hopium that we use is that we want to do more and worry less, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all have this worry and fear about what's going to happen to the U.S. Well, don't have worry and fear, just channel it into concrete action. And I think that this collective impact of all these people doing this work is giving the Democratic Party the, the most powerful political machine that it's ever had. Mm -hmm. And we keep pushing performance to the upper end of what's possible again and again in election after election. And this fact that we have all these proud patriots, these people who love their country, who are doing all this work, is a central reason I'm so optimistic about our ability to win in 2024, because we only have to win in seven states. Mm. Right. And, you know, we made our community, the grassroots community, made two million phone calls. Wow. Into, into New York three in five Ooh. weeks. <laughs> wow. Imagine, you know, how many phone calls do we need to make to win those seven states in the general election? What do we need to make? 30 million calls, 40 million calls? If we can make 2 million calls in a single house race to push our turnout through the roof as we did in New York three, imagine what we're going to be able to do together in seven states in the general election. And so, you know, I'm really optimistic. I mean, look, I, I, I'm not so hopium. And just to explain that, finally, <laughs> hope, hopium was a slur used against me in 2022. It was, oh. I was accused of smoking hopium by oh, me, got it. Uh, <laughs> when I was arguing that it was going to be a close competitive election <laughs> and that it was uh, this mix of opium and hope. And hope. And, and I was, it was used by Nate Silver and by Amy Walter from the Cook Report and other people used mm -hmm. it and said I was delusional and delude and I was leading on my or a little party and telling them that they had a competitive chance to have a good election. And then we had it. And so I used it as a way of signifying that the power of hope is incredible. The power of not obeying in advance, as Timothy Snyder says, is our obligation. The fact that, you know, we talk about hopium in our community is hope with a plan. We don't just want the election. We just don't hope the election is going to go well we work to make it so. And that what, what I think we've been able to demonstrate is that we don't have to accept reality as it is. We don't have to let a red wave come. It's up to us about what happens with our democracy and that going to work, doing the work to save our democracy is the, you know some of the highest form of patriotism that one can possibly imagine in America. And, and I'm really 
uh, gratified that there's been such an extraordinary response to this call that I've put out to come and spend time with us and work to make sure our democracy doesn't slip away. That's wonderful. Do more, worry less. Do more, worry less. Can I say one last thing? Because I know we're wrapping Please, up. Please, yeah. yeah. You're the yeah. one that's got to go. I know. I know. We can talk I know, to you another, I, I, another I, I hour. <laughs> Let's go a few more minutes. But I, I want to okay. just, and this is for this international audience that yeah. I, I just want to speak to for a second, is that, you know, my wife always wonders when I'm going to go get a real job. And I think <laughs> at this point uh, <laughs> in my life, it probably will never happen. And, um, She's making money. And, she? No, hell no. She works at the White House. <laughs> so, she makes <laughs> so, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're saving our pennies here. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, so what I think about and what motivates me more than anything else, right. We all have these ways that we get up in the morning and we do our thing, whatever our things are in life. And for me, it, it comes back to FDR's four freedom speech in 1941. And when FDR looked at the world in the state of the union in January of 1941, and he said, I want to imagine a world that isn't based on dominion and authoritarianism and autocracy, but a world based on freedom. And he laid out his four freedoms, and those four freedoms became uh, the basis of the Atlantic Charter with Winston Churchill and FDR, which became the, the core of the allied relationship that won the war. The four freedoms became the basis of the UN Charter in 1945. The four freedoms became the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And the entire modern world that we all know was built on top of these four freedoms. And these four freedoms and the theory behind them uh, and the world that we built with them created a golden age in human history. There's never been a better time to be alive in the world uh, than it's been during this time of the four freedoms and the Pax Americana. We've seen more people live under democracies in this period than any time in human history, despite huge population growth the, the number of people who are um, have extreme poverty has plummeted to very low levels. We know that life expectancy in the world has gone from 45 years to 71 years during this period. And that we know that people of color and minorities and women of all kinds uh, have had more opportunity during this period than any time in human history. And what's really important to recognize is that this golden age was something that we did we created that. The Democratic Party of the United States built that. And that we are part of what may be the most noble political project in all of human history. It's possible that the Democratic Party has done more good for more people than any other political party in all of human history. And we are the heirs of all that. Mm -hmm. This is what the fight is in this election. You all know that who live abroad, that the world that you live in and inhabit, this sort of freedom of movement, this freedom of speech, the freedom of trade, the, all the things that you have are all things that we did. We created all that. Democrats, we created all that. And that we have now this enormous obligation to make sure that that world that we built, that FDR and our forebears built for us in the world, are there for our kids and our grandkids. And that's what's really at stake. And that's why I do all this work. That's why I'm with you today. That's why I'm really excited to learn about the great work that you do, the important work that you all do, because we're here in this together. And it's why that everyone who's listening, you know, you got to leave it all in the playing field this year, everybody. Like there's mm -hmm. no, there's no choice. I mean, if we don't, you don't want to wake up in November and recognizing that the country that you grew up in and have been part of isn't going to be there for you anymore. Yeah. And the possibility of that happening is very high, but we have the power to prevent that if we do the work and go win this election the way I think we can. Those are inspiring words. Thank you. I feel like we should, I confess I had to look them up, but I feel like we should name the four freedoms. Freedom, freedom of, I know, and I, I, the reason I don't always name it is I always get them. I've said it well, so I, many times, I get confused. But I, know, it's, it's I Googled it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, Google. so it, it's freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, freedom from want, right? That's, is right. That, yeah. That's exactly right. He, yeah. Although fear comes last on the list that I found. Right. I, I didn't That's do it FDR's in the right order. But, yeah. <laughs> That's and it. I, and I, what happened is I misstated it once, and I so I've now gotten sp spooked. <laughs> spooked <laughs> right? you know, by, so I just say those four freedoms. But yeah. in some ways, it doesn't, you know, what's interesting about even your question, right, is that there's enormous elegance 
in the I mean to me what's the 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 key is not the the enumerated freedoms it's that it's the concept of freedom yeah. as the organizing principle of the modern world and it's what putin is fighting against it's what she is fighting against it's what the iranian government is fighting against it's what hezbollah and hamas are fighting against is the is a world that's predicated not on dominion mm-hmm and control of others, but around freedom. Yeah. And and Biden, to his credit, has really centered his campaign on freedom and freedoms. And that is the thing that is motivating people to do the work on the Democratic Party right now. The sense, and this is why I think Biden has at least conceptually crafted a narrative and story that's reaching deep into the emotional core of where the Democratic Party is right now. But we got to get the campaign going and we got to go out and fight harder. I think everyone's ready to go to work. Yeah. And the campaign's been a little bit late in my view, but you know, this is a fixable thing. We can we can address that and um and we got to get going because you know, Joe Biden told us when his speech in Valley Forge in January that, you know, democracy was on the line in this election and that he needed everybody in the fight with him. And so he's already asked everybody who's listening to be part of this campaign, to be part of the effort to preserve American democracy. And so you just have to decide how you're going to do that. It's not whether or if, but how. And that's what we all need to be doing now, because it's now or never, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Do more, worry less. Do more, worry less. (laughs) Simon, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a a real privilege and a pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you for what you do. And uh, thank you for the admonition that we got to keep it fun or, you know, it isn't. <laughs> and, and so or I, no I, one's going to care. Or no one's going to care. I have my little fun diaper thing. You know, I, did I still but haven't I need, Googled it. I don't know. I know. I know. I need to do more. I need to do more of that and, uh, because it's other, otherwise it just gets too heavy. Right. Yep. OK. I love you guys. Thank you. And just thank uh, you. Um, everyone just be optimistic and we'll okay. get this done together. Thanks, everybody. Well done, thanks. <laughs> I'm Rachel Oyster with David Schellenberg in Ottawa, Canada. If you live outside the U.S., go to votefromabroad.org to register with your voting state and request your ballot. And thank you for listening to Democrats Abroad, the Blue Vote Cafe.